That's great. So you're working 25 hours a week and you're making um, six figures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a dream, right? Way to go. <laughs> This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill, and today we're talking about becoming a new parent and what it takes to navigate the marital and financial waters that await us. There are lots of decisions that come with uh, being a first-time parent. What are we going to do for child care? How does this affect our income? Can we afford this new life of ours? Today, we're going to speak with a new parent who's recently had to answer a lot of those questions. Sarah Lee Kane is our guest today. She is a young mother, a wife, and a full-time writer. Some of her writing clients include Vistaprint, Quicken Loans, and Discover. Yes, she's a financial nerd just like me. Uh, She also is the co-host of the Beyond the Dollar podcast that helps People ponder the intersection between life and money. I absolutely loved being on her show, so I am super excited to have her on mine. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. You make me sound like I'm this really awesome person. (laughs) Well, I think you are, and that's really all that matters, right? (laughs) Oh, thank you. (laughs) So, Sarah, how did you and your husband get together originally? So, we actually met in China um, we, it was funny story. I had just moved to China a week before he did. And when I met him, he was severely jet lagged. He, I think, arrived about 10 PM that night and then had to go to school the next day at about 7 AM. So he barely had any sleep. And I don't think he remembers meeting me, but he, <laughs> his version of the stories was, I fell in love. It was love at first sight. So that, that's all that matters, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys met in China and then like, uh, what, uh, what were you guys doing for work at the time? So I was teaching grade two and he was teaching element, uh, sorry, not middle school English. So you guys were both teachers in China mm-hmm. and then you got together. Was, was it your love of teaching that helped, uh, make the, the, the sparks fly? Maybe. I, I'm not quite sure. We became <laughs> friends, and I think we were both in denial that we had a crush on each other. And then we finally said, hey, you want to go out? And then a couple years later, we got married. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you guys got married. Did you guys get married in China or back in the U.S.? So we got married in Hong Kong, which is technically part of China. And the reason we did that was... I have a lot of family members still living in Hong Kong, and it was actually much easier for people to fly in. And fun fact, we scheduled it around exams and school holidays. We made sure, and we also made sure that the flights weren't too expensive for everyone that decided to fly to uh, to come to our wedding. That's cool. And you had a lot of people flying in from other countries, I take, I take it then. Yes. That's very cool. Very cool. What an international wedding. How fun. So when did you guys decide to become parents? How did you have your first child? When did that happen? So I was actually very anti-children for a long time. Uh, After we got married, my husband knew that and he was okay with that for quite a while. And I think it was until, I'd like to say five years ago that I was like, oh, I've started changing my mind. And then I got into a fight with him. I was picking a fight with him for no reason. So, of course, we're just bickering. All of a sudden, I was like, I want children. And he said, I want children, too. And then that was kind of the end. That was our decision right there. (laughs) (laughs) So it was both boiling up inside of you guys just weren't talking about it. Exactly. (laughs) Interesting. Wow. Okay. So so you guys got married. How how long in between the marriage and the your, your son being born? So we got married 2010, so about five-ish years, yeah. Okay, so Mm five-ish years later, you guys decide to have your baby boy. Awesome. So Mm -hmm. as you were heading into becoming parents, you know, there's lots of conversations that happen with with the spouses as they're deciding to become parents. There's, you know, money conversations. What are we going to do for work? What type of conversations were you guys having right around this time when your son came into the world? So one of the first conversations we had was actually around his citizenship. So I'm originally from Canada. My husband's American. And so when we found out that I was pregnant, we we had to really discuss like what, where do we want to see ourselves in five years? Do we want to stay in China? Do we want to move to the US? Do we want to move to Canada? What 
other country. And then we had to think about, okay, which one's the easiest passport to get? Um, which consulates are the best? So it's, it's a it's a bit of a different conversation than I suppose most families have that don't live overseas. And so that really was a big one. And then, then it became more um, financial because in China, depending on the employer, they don't necessarily provide health insurance. Mm. And so... So what ended up happening was the place where we both ended up working last, they didn't provide us health insurance. Now, legally, they were supposed to. They they didn't. They weren't. The owner wasn't very on the up and up. But there was a clause in the contract that said that he would pay for 100 percent of um, all medical procedures. And so I was like, well, childbirth counts as a medical procedure. Prenatal checkups counts as that. So. Then our next conversation became, how do we pay for everything up front and then get our the owner of the school to reimburse us? So that was a pretty long process. Uh, we involved our principal. She helped us negotiate um, a seven-week maternity leave for myself because that, that wasn't in the contract either. So it was a lot of that. It was, it was kind of an uphill battle, but in the end, we got everything that we um, that we were owed. Wow, it's like so you were structuring the the way that uh, a woman needs to go through uh, the healthcare process uh, with your job. That's incredible. It's not wasn't just kind of given to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think that the owner, in retrospect, didn't realize how much it would cost to be pregnant in China. And so, I mean, if if you were local and went to a local hospital, it's cheap by U.S. standards, as in like dollar amounts. But I think. All in all, with prenatal, postnatal, and birth, it was about $25,000 U.S. And so we had to pay all that up front. So luckily, my husband and I are really good savers. And so we did have that money in a bank account that we were going to transfer to the U.S. anyways. We were like, no, let's just save that for the child care. And, um, and then when the owner of the school was trying to negotiate paying us back in increments, we weren't too worried that we weren't going to get the money all back at once because, again, we, we managed our money well enough that that money wasn't desperately needed. Hmm. And so were you able to get that all that money back then from him? We did. We That's did. That's good. That's good. Okay, cool. So after the the child was born, um, you guys needed to make some decisions on child care and who's taking care of, the, of your baby. How, how did that all go? So we knew that we were going to stay in China for another year just because Number one, because our contract um, made us stay another year. <laughs> Not made us. It. Um, we signed a two-year contract when I when I found out I was pregnant. So that. So we knew that we needed to find um, a nanny. So there isn't really daycare in China um, that we knew of, um, or that really had somebody that spoke English. And so we knew a lot of expats who had multiple children and they all were raised, the children were raised by nannies essentially. And so we asked our friends like, how much does it cost? What does it entail? Do they come into your home? How does all that work? And so we interviewed a few. And so for the first year of my son's life, he had a nanny. And so it was great. We, we walked to work. It was a 10 minute walk to work. If there was ever an emergency, we could just go back home and the nanny was great. We had a really great relationship with her. That's great. So at, at what point did you guys make the move back to the U.S. then? So it was actually very shortly before my son was born. This was, again, a conversation we've had for quite a few years. We we were kind of waffling like, oh, what do we want to do? And then we were kind of like dilly-dallying on applying for jobs. I was still doing freelancing as a side hustle. This was for fun at the time. And then... We decided, okay, let's let's make it go of the U.S., right? Let's try it for a few years, see how we like it. And so because my teaching license was from Canada, I just assumed to be really difficult to get my degree equivalented. I think that is a technical term. <laughs> um, and to get my teaching license equivalented and all of that. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe I can do this freelance writing thing until that happens. And so the more... Did freelance writing, the more clients I got, the more I thought, you know what, I really actually want to stay home with my son. Maybe I can make a go of this. And it really didn't, I wasn't, wasn't that motivated until after he was born. Mm-hmm. Like I remember going back to work and I would just start missing him. And I know it's natural to do that, but it was really like, no, I just want to walk home. It's only a 10 minute walk. And so I would do that during my prep periods. And I was like, okay, if I can replace my salary, 
we have two years worth of expenses in an emergency fund. I can make a go of this. And so my husband and I had a very long chat. Um, you know, as long as he had something in the U.S., it, we actually didn't really care where we moved to the in the U.S. And so we ended up in North Carolina for the first year that we were here. So we said, okay, you get your teaching job. I'm going to do the freelance writing. We did kind of set a deadline for me. So we decided that if in like, I think it was like six to eight months, I wasn't making a dime, I would go back to a full-time job. Got it. And then after that six to eight months, you you made a made a good go at it? Yeah. And I essentially replaced my teaching salary. And then this year I doubled it. So that was really exciting. <laughs> That's awesome. So what were uh-huh. you making as a teacher originally? So, gosh, if I convert it, so because I got paid in Chinese RMB. So if I had to convert, I think it, my highest salary was about forty five, fifty thousand dollars dollars U.S. dollars. But the cool thing about teaching overseas, so it depends on the school. But if you're a certified teacher teaching overseas at an international school, you typically get free housing. You typically get um, like a free flight each year, like back to your home country. So we got a free flight back and forth to the U.S. each year. We didn't have to pay for rent. We didn't have a car. We walked to work. And so, um, you know, if we counted all of that, probably 60, 70 grand if you're counting all the benefits. But salary wise, it was about yeah, forty five thousand, fifty thousand. That's mm-hmm. incredible. So you you matched what you were making after a short period of time, and now you're saying you're doubling it. So you're getting close to six figures with your with your writing gig. Yeah. So as of September, I invoiced six uh, figures nice. worth of work. Way to yeah. go, <laughs> rock star. That's cool. So you are doing this full time writing thing now from home, and. What is the situation with your son? Is he in daycare while you're doing this? Are you doing part-time? How does that all work now? So this is a hard lesson learned. If anybody ever thinks of this romantic ideal of like your son sitting on your lap while you're typing, that is not true because I thought that. (laughs) Um, So he's actually in part-time preschool. So in the mornings, three days a week, he's at a preschool. And then I do have drop off daycare if I ever really do have things where I, um, you know, like, let's say getting on a podcast interview, things like that, or really important phone calls, and I would put him at the drop off daycare. And it's really cheap where I live. Like, I think if you prepay for, I don't remember how many hours, it's like $5 an hour, essentially to get drop off daycare, which is ridiculously cheap if you think about it. Absolutely. So how does that work? So you do you call them maybe an hour before saying, hey, I would like to bring him by or do you have to pre-schedule it? How does that work? It, it's probably very interesting for, for working mothers uh, or working parents that are at home too. Mm-hmm. So with the ones in my area, I think for infants, I think like if you're younger, if they're younger at two than two, you have to actually call ahead, I think a day or two and let them know what time. But if they're older than that, so my son's three now, so if they're older than that, you can actually essentially just drop them off. So you have to register, you have to, you know, give them their shot records and um, pay like a registration fee. I think, I think I paid it maybe 80 bucks. So it depends on the, the daycare. And then after that, you can prepay hours or you can pay by the hour. And then I mean, I've just shown up as long as I guess they're open, duh, right? <laughs> as long as they're right, open. Right, yeah. General hours are probably, what, yeah. eight, 8 to yeah, 6 but, or something like that? Yeah, or? yeah, something like that. So as long as they're open, then I drop them off. And then I, I usually let them know what time I'm going to pick them up. But And then that's it. Yeah. That's very convenient. What part of the country are you living in now? You said you were in North Carolina, and now where are you? Uh, Florida. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So... So that's, I mean, so how many hours a week are you working then? So he's in daycare for a portion and then you do the drop off stuff. Like what's the balance of, you know, uh, your, your, your responsibilities as a mother and then your responsibilities with your, your writing, your writing gigs. So it took a f- quite a few years to get to the point where I've got some pretty decent systems going. So I think, I mean, it's hard to say like definitively how much I work sometimes because I do get distracted when he's home, my son's home. Um, I'd say like 25 hours a week, a a little bit more now with the podcast, but I would say I I try to cap it like 25 hours a week. That's great. So you're working 25 hours a week and you're making um, six figures. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's a dream, right? (laughs) Way to go. No, I mean, it is. I mean, you, you are also location independent too with what you're doing. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So if you guys decided to pick up and move to 
wherever um, you could continue doing your gig. I know your husband has a, is he working as a teacher still? Yes, he is. Okay, cool. I mean, obviously you can be a teacher in multiple places, but obviously that's, you, you have a little bit more flexibility with your gig. Is that right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that there's tons of like K-12 online schools. So if, if he were to ever want to be a bit more location independent, we could definitely look into those options for him and he can consider doing that in the future. Have you thought about that? I mean, is, uh, is Florida your home forever? Or are you thinking about something in the future? It's so funny because I get asked this a lot because mm-hmm. I think every time I meet somebody, they're like, oh, where are you living now? Because I seem to go to a new place like every year. So the fact that we've been in Florida for over a year now is a surprise to many people. <laughs> um, we may stay here for the foreseeable future because we're actually considering buying a home, which shocks many people as well because we, we've been renters for life for a long, long time. So, I mean, I love Florida. I do miss winter. Mm-hmm. I say this now that I'm not near snow for however many years, but I do miss, I do miss having proper four seasons, but I do like Florida. We've got a nice little community here. My son has some fun friends. I can go to the beach. I'm like 10 minutes away. So can't complain. That is awesome. And you can do your laptop lifestyle on the beach. That's uh, that's a pretty good deal. (laughs) We'll be back to the show after a word from our sponsors. Do you have life insurance? If you don't, and you have a family that depends on your income, it is time to put a quality term life insurance policy at the top of your to-do list. And the partner that's going to make the process simple and easy for you is Quotacy. Quotacy is dedicated to helping people get affordable term life insurance so they can protect their families from the unexpected. They compare the best rates for your policy options so you don't have to shop agent to agent. Insurance prices are regulated so you won't find better rates, even if you work directly with the insurer. This saves you time and money. With Quotacy, the life insurance process can be done easily online, and if you want to chat with somebody from their care team, you can easily live chat, text, or email, or talk to somebody over the phone the old-fashioned way. <laughs> to get your free quote with no contact information required, go to marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Quotacy. That's marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Quotacy. That's Q-U-O-T-A-C-Y. Quotacy is term life made simple. We're heading into the new year, my friends. It is time to take control of your money. And Tiller is an excellent way to make the process simple and easy. Tiller is the easiest way to optimize your personal and business finances with the flexibility of a spreadsheet. The beauty of the Tiller system is that it automatically updates your financial information through Google Sheets and Excel. This way you're not spending time manually updating your numbers. More time for fun, right? (laughs) I'm a big fan of their net worth tracker and their monthly budget template. It makes me feel like I'm truly in control of my cash. For a 30-day free trial of this versatile budgeting system, go to marriagekidsandmoney.com slash tiller. That's marriagekidsandmoney.com slash tiller, T-I-L-L-E-R. With Tiller, you'll always know exactly where your money goes. Thanks for considering our sponsors, everybody. Let's jump back into our show. Yeah. So, so you said it took a little while for you to get to this point where you've kind of got it all figured out, right? You got the 25 hours a week, you're making the six figures. So like, what were some of the difficult parts in those first few months? Well, I guess as you guys have transitioned, it's it's been a little different with the teaching gig. But what were some of the difficult um, steps or things that you had to go through just in the first few months of being a mother? So I think one of the biggest transitions, I'm a very autonomous, independent woman. And so I like my space. And so when my son was born, it's a little bit difficult to have time for yourself. Um, And it was a little bit hard because we didn't have close family nearby when we were overseas. So I mean, the nanny was a great support system. Our coworkers were really great. We had some really great friends. But it was very difficult as a first time mom, especially someone I have never been around young children ever before. I mean, yes, I taught grade two, but I'm talking about like young children, like newborns, toddlers. And so it was such a massive learning curve for me to figure out like, what does this baby need if she's, you know, if he's crying and all of that and, and navigating, um, you know, if he needs medicine, like buying clothes because the sizes are different there. So it's like these little things that you take for granted when you, let's say you go to a 
babies are us now where you can go, okay, he's like six to 12 months. I can go find a onesie. Whereas if I'm in China, it's like, oh, it's size 130, you know? So, so there are times when I was sleep deprived and I don't get the comforts of home and I'm in the store and I will just, I mean, yeah, there have been times when I've just spontaneously burst into tears because I can't find the right size diaper for my son, right? So it was like these little things that kind of popped up. And, you know, now that he's a little bit older and I think my husband and I have just so many conversations since he was born, we are very adamant about giving each other space alone with um, our son and then as a couple because I think that um, if I didn't, have those conversations and if I wasn't so adamant in having that space by myself with my husband and with my son I would have I would have seriously gone crazy (laughs) yeah that's that's a lot and it's real as you are you know transitioning from you know your your position with the teacher and then transitioning to the full-time writer and then becoming a young mother all at the same time you know and your your newer marriage it's a lot mm-hmm. to deal with all at once, so I can definitely understand the emotional impact of that. So, as you were as you were transitioning from teacher into this full time writing thing, were, was there times um, that you guys felt some financial strain as you were making that change, or did it kind of seamlessly move move across? I think it was more mindset than anything. Like the numbers in the bank and our investments were like really good. And like I mentioned before, we had two years worth of savings saved up. And so even if my husband didn't find something and I didn't find something, we were going to be fine. Like health, I mean, health insurance, yeah, we'd have to figure that out when we get to the U.S. But it was one of those things where like we would have been fine. Like if worst case scenario, we can move in with my parents or my in-laws or we have friends that would take us in. So we weren't in dire straits at all. It was really the transition from China to the U.S. So moving across the world is not easy enough, right? But my, it was like, we moved across the world. I left teaching to do freelance writing. We have a one-year-old. My husband was moving to a new job. We didn't even see our apartment before we moved in. We had, so then we, and then we arrived in Pittsburgh and then we had to drive all our stuff to North Carolina. So it was like all of these things happened at the same time. And I think the second thing too, was like I said before, I didn't pay for rent for almost like 12 years since I've been overseas. And so having that expense on a budget in our budget was like a shock, even though, again, we can afford it. Um, Things were a little bit more expensive in the U.S. So that was another bit of like a shock to say, oh, my gosh, I'm paying how much for groceries now? Before it was like 100 bucks a month. Right. So it was just kind of it was all of these things at once because you're tired from taking care of the kid. You're tired from moving. You're tired from like transitioning to new jobs. So it was like all of that that. I don't want to say made it bad. It just made it a longer transition than I think if it was just one thing that we had to do, if that made sense. That does make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Lots of uh, lots of things to think about. Big changes between the countries, prices to deal with. I, I think that, um, yeah, I appreciate you breaking that down for everybody. So, you know, I, I'm thinking of a, a working parent right now or or somebody that's looking to make some transition to have this this optimized optimized week that you've designed here of 25, 25 hours on average and then you know having some time where your where your son is in daycare and learning and preschool and then also you get some time to spend with them as well what do you think would be some um, advice you'd give to let's say a parent that's looking to create a situation like you have right now, they're maybe working some crazy hours and they want to transition out of a job into a life like this. What would, what would be some advice you'd give them? So two things, number one, make sure you take care of yourself physically and mentally, because there are times now where I do, I do not take care of myself and my work and my family will like, not reap the benefits, the opposite of that. (laughs) Um, So, so definitely take care of yourself, no matter how stressful your situation or, you know, your family's really demanding, make sure you do that. Because if you're not physically well, you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to be in that mindset to, to think about like, how do I transition from where I'm at now to where I'm going to go? The second thing I would think about is like really get clear on why it is that you want to do it. And, it's great to say I want to stay home while my kid's young or I want more flexibility. Those are really great things. But 
why do you want the flexible lifestyle? Why do you want to stay home with your son? Like, what are these or your child? Like, why? So I really asked myself why five times to really get to the core of why I wanted to the lifestyle that I do. And yes, I do want to stay home with my son. That is that is like a huge reason. But the the deeper I dug into like why I wanted to do this, it really had to do with the fact that I wanted more autonomy in my life. Um, you know, I love teaching. It's, I still love it. I probably may return to it someday. I mean, never to say never, right? But it was one of those where I, I'm a creative. I will create any uh, anything and everything, and I love helping people. And so I want to create a career and a lifestyle where I have control over what I can and cannot create. And so that's ultimately like the the biggest why that I have. Um, and then every time I get stressed, right, I go, okay, am I taking care of myself or am I, are these steps that I'm doing towards my big why? So those are definitely just two things I would definitely recommend to people. I think that's great. And then how, how did you decide that writing was the thing that you were going to jump into as opposed to anything else? What, what, what made you say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give that a try. Was it just the convenience of it? Have you always liked writing? And I'm just trying to think of how people can boil it down for themselves if they're looking for something to do. Oh, that's a great question. So for me, it was quite an accident. Um, I remember being really bored one day and I'm like, oh, I'm going to like just do a random Google search. And I happened to land upon freelance writing. And it was like, oh, you can get paid to write for blogs. And I thought, oh, that's neat. And so I, I remember pitching to six of them and I got... I got approved for five. And so I made like my first 50 bucks writing about zombies, which I still think it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Um, and so I'm like, OK, let me let me continue with this. And so I just kind of like was really open minded about it. And what I really enjoy now about freelance writing, two things. Number one, I can get creative with my pitches. Um, you know, I get I tend to be a little bit choosier with who I write for. So I do. I mean, I'll admit sometimes I do write some boring stuff, but there's a lot where I write that is really fun. So I like that as an outlet. Um, number two, it works better on my schedule because if I'm writing an article, my son's having a meltdown in front of me. I don't, I'm not necessarily tied to like filming a video or getting on a phone call or I'm at a physical location where it's a little bit more challenging to navigate. And so maybe those are the things that Whoever wants to start something on the side or even transition completely, just think about like, okay, is my son going to be in full-time daycare or is he going to be part-time? Um, what do I prefer to do? Do I hate talking on the phone? If I do, then don't find something where you to talk on the phone. If you hate writing, don't feel like you have to write. There are so many options out there that, um, you know, just, I mean, I'd say it's like start experimenting and see what you like because you never know. I like that. That that's that. I like that. Uh, that's a really good piece of advice. Hey, so where where you are right now? I mean, I, I love this big fu fund that you guys had. <laughs> or still, do you still have that amount? Two years just sitting there right now. Part of it is uh, actually in a house fund, and then part of it is like a regular emergency fund. That's great. Okay, so mm-hmm. w- what's the debt situation with the family? Do you guys have any debt left, or? We have not been in debt since we were married, so okay. over 10 years. Mm-hmm. So you have no debt, and you've got this this big amount of money and savings, and you're making six figures working 25 hours a week, and I'm sure your husband's breaking in some money too. So what what goals do you guys have over the next, what, five, 10 years as a family financially? Oh, my gosh. So we've been talking about fire a lot um, in our house, and so we're trying to... Actually, my husband's been kind of geeking out on the fire calculator. So for anybody who doesn't know, it's financial independence, retire early. So he's been geeking out about different numbers and how we can optimize our income in the next 10-ish years so we can retire. So the next five years, I would like to be halfway to retirement or at least work optional where I don't have to work if I don't want to. Um, And I think we also really talked about... um, be a little bit more settled in one place, whether that's Florida or somewhere else, just because we want to make sure that our son has a nice routine when he starts grade one. I love it. So uh, um, you you talk about fire, um, but it seems like you've got this this lifestyle set up where you're doing what you want. Is it more along the lines of not having to write as much or not having to make the income in order to get there? Or is it more um, retire early for your for your husband? 
So both. I mean, I think he, he's joked where he's like, oh, if you make 200 grand, I can retire next year. Right. So he's always teasing like, oh, hey, are you going to double your income next year? All that. Um, I would love to eventually retire him. I think he loves teaching it. it I know it wears him down. Um, and kudos to all the teachers out there, by the way, like it's a difficult job. Um, but yeah, no, if, if I think about it now, I am living the life that I want and I love it. I am so grateful every day to have, to be able to, to do the things that I'm doing right now. I think, I think to reach fire, it's more the numbers now. It's not even the lifestyle. Um, I mean, I like writing. I don't think I'll stop, but I, I would like to be pickier about what I want to do, if that makes sense. And I also don't necessarily want to work as uh, not work, sorry, don't not write in the volume that I'm writing. So I do quite a bit of writing now, which again, I'm not complaining. I love it. But you know, if there are days where I'm like, Oh, I don't feel like it. Then if I have less of a workload, I can kind of schedule my due dates a little bit differently. How many articles do you think you're cranking out a week? So this is going to sound totally crazy because my, one of my wonderful freelance writer friends yelled at me last month, (laughs) (laughs) the last two months, um, I averaged about 50,000 words each month, wow. which is like a novel or two. Yeah, wow. it's a lot. <laughs> it flows for you, huh? <laughs> it, yeah, it's a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Very cool. So, okay. Um, so you guys planning to do a little financial independence. So how, how are you, what are you doing to gain that financial independence? Obviously, you can throw that all into a big bank account, but you could do some other things too. So what are you guys thinking about investing? You guys thinking about real estate? What's, uh, what's your exciting plan for, for FIRE? So we stick a lot of, most of our money in very boring Vanguard funds right? Uh, VTI for anybody who's really nosy. (laughs) That's what we're mainly doing. I have some in real estate crowdfunding. I kind of did it just for fun. Um, It's earning a little bit. I don't remember how much, but it's earning a little bit. My husband has his 401k, so we're trying to max out that. I have a solo 401k, so that is for people who are self-employed. You can open up your own 401k, and it's great because I think you can it depends on how much you make, but you, I think the max, max you can put in is like $54,000 a year. So $54,000 pre-tax money is pretty sweet. So I have that option. And then when we do buy a house, we are actually considering house hacking. So that's another way to lower our housing expenses. And then we can take that amount that we do save um, into, we can either stick it in Vanguard or I can stick it in my 401k. Tell people so what house hacking is. So house hacking is where you purchase a home. It can be a duplex or it can just be single family home. And then what you do is you either rent it out. You can do it like Airbnb style or you rent out to long-term tenants. And then they essentially pay the mortgage for you from the rent that you earn from them. Love it. I Mm -hmm. love that one. Yeah, very cool. So do you guys uh, see any additional children in your future? That is a big no. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. You've got your boy. Maybe, yeah. It's like maybe a happy. fur baby, but human baby, no. <laughs> hey, it's good to have limits. I, um, we just, we just uh, surgically made that decision as well in okay. our family. So we're, uh, we're all good. And we said, if you, if I'm going to get personal with you, I might as well get personal back with you. So <laughs> cool. So, um, Let's see. So I just want to um, ask a couple more questions and we'll roll into it. So we talked about some um, parents that maybe were in the situation that, um, you know, were, were thinking about making that transition. And thank you for giving us that, that advice. I, I, I want to I talk to the parents out there that are maybe working right now and they're not considering having kids just because they, they think it's too expensive or too difficult you know, what, what, what would you say to them? Obviously you've got, you've got your boy and you're making this work and you're making good money as a, as a working mom. Why do you think it's, it's worth it to be a parent? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. Cause I remember when you sent me that, I was like, oh man, I have to think about a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't, I mean, okay, I'm in a really privileged position. I'm just going to acknowledge that where, I don't want to necessarily just make decisions based on financial matters. I know that there's a lot of people where, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck and they don't make enough. And, and that's a totally real problem. For But for many of us who are in a more privileged position where we are making, let's say, middle class income and we're like, oh, we don't want children because it's expensive. Right. It doesn't have to be. Right. And 
for me, like being a parent has changed me in so many ways. It sounds so cliche, but it has made me appreciate life so much more. Like watching him come to a discovery about like how to open a water bottle and laughing about it because he's like so excited that he can open a water bottle and now he's discovered you can put a straw in a water bottle like these simple things like watching him do that and exploring the world has made me realize like I am taking so much for granted and I mean yes you like you got sleep deprivation you got like toddler meltdowns but it's but it's just seeing things from a kid's eyes again has made me just yeah again it just made me really really appreciate what I've got and so that has been, I think, the most rewarding part of parenting for me. I love it. Thank you. And and so do you have a do you have a book that's helped you over the last, you know, you've had some pretty good success over the past four years, obviously, you know, um, becoming a mother and growing your business and uh, transitioning to the States. Has there been a book that's uh, helped you over that process over the past couple of years? Oh, there's so many. So one that immediately comes to mind, it's called, I um, can't remember the author, but it's called Buddhism for Mothers. And so you don't have to be a Buddhist to read it. It just it just really takes the Buddhist principles of um, like do no harm. I'm trying to think like um, different ones where and then she kind of applies it to motherhood. And so I remember this one passage where she talks about her kid throwing a tantrum and then, you know, for most parent, many parents out there, if you're listening with young children, you totally get it. Like he's your son or daughter's having a meltdown. You just all you want to do is just scream and throw something against the wall. Like I've been there, and I remember reading this passage where she's like, "I just sat there and I breathed, and then the tantrum was done, and I was like, and then life went on." And I thought, "Huh, like that? That's cool." And so I remember trying that the next time my son had a tantrum it lasted for more than a few minutes. I think it was like 10 minutes where I'm like, <gasps> like breathing, <laughs> but um, yeah, it passed. And I was like, okay, so, you know, if I want to think about it, if anything kind of crazy goes on, like I've survived transitioning a career, moving across the U uh, not U S the world, um, you know, fighting for my medical bills being paid. Like I can, this is just another season of life. I can, I can do this. And just breathe through it. Mm-hmm. I love it. Sarah, where can people follow you and connect with you more? Sure. If you want to listen to the podcast, just go over to beyondthedollar.co. I also write some blogs over there as well. And then if you are into social media, follow me on Twitter at Sarah Lee Kane. And then I promised our listeners I'd be back on Instagram. So at Beyond the Dollar on Instagram. Excellent. Well, everybody, I had a chance to be on the show Beyond the Dollar. It is awesome. And they truly do go beyond the dollar. It's not just all money talk. It's about important topics uh, for life and money. So definitely check it out. Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy, for having me. I am so impressed by people who define their dreams clearly and then push towards them until they become real. Sarah is the epitome of that. She wanted to be a mother, she wanted to do something creative with her life, and she wanted to make good money at the same time. And as you heard, she's done all of those things, and I can't wait to see what she's going to do next. She's inspiring. I'm inspired. Call her me inspired. <laughs> Here are my top three takeaways from my conversation with Sarah Lee Kane. Number one, set big goals. Whether it's moving across the world, starting a family, marrying the love of your life, or starting a business to follow your passion, you won't achieve any of these things without first dreaming big. Sarah, prove this to us. Think about what your goals are and write them down, my friends. We're heading into the new year, so now's a perfect time to start writing down your dreams and then charting out the path to get there. Number two, give yourself a savings cushion. Now, these entrepreneurial success stories can be very motivating. People like Sarah may get us all inspired to throw caution to the wind, quit our jobs, and sail across the ocean into the sunset. But that's not going to work out very well without a plan or a safety net. 
Sarah's safety net was two years of living expenses. So if things didn't work out with their move to the U.S. or her entrepreneurial venture or her desire to work at home, well, she had two years of expenses to fall back on. That's a lot of money. Fortunately, she was a freaking success. (laughs) So they didn't have to touch it at all, really. My point here is be passionate, be bold, but be smart and build up a nice emergency fund or an FU fund before making any big life changing moves. Number three, follow your passion because it pays. Sarah's story is great because she's making six figures working part time from home and gets to spend quality time with her son and her husband. But Sarah's story is excellent because she's followed her passion for creativity and autonomy through writing, and she gets all of those aforementioned perks. (laughs) That's a winner, man. She is a winner. I honestly believe she was so successful because she chose a path that inspired her. You heard her say it. She's a creative. She wanted to do creative things, and now she is, and it's paying well, my friends. So those were my top three takeaways. Number one, set big goals. Number two, give yourself a savings cushion. And then number three, follow your passion because it pays. I hope this chat with Sarah helps you think of your big, big, big goals. And hey, remember my MKM challenge from last week? What goals or big steps towards your goals can you accomplish before the end of the year? The countdown is on, my friends. A couple weeks, man. Three weeks, four weeks. What do we got? Anyway, write it down. Make a plan. Take action. And before you know it, you'll realize your dreams. Now it's time to announce the Money Master of the Week. Tim from Life for the Better recently had a huge net worth win. At the age of 25 years old, Tim has achieved a net worth of $225,000. That is insane. (laughs) So how the heck did he do this at 25? According to his article, which I will post in the show notes for you guys to check out, Tim did these three things amongst others. Number one, He served in the military, so he received the GI Bill for his service, so bye-bye student loans. And then number two, he had a savings rate of around 60 to 70%. That is a lot of money to save. And with that money, he invested early by maxing out his retirement options and becoming a landlord in his early 20s. He's a rental property owner in his early 20s. That's so cool. What a winner. At this rate, he will be a young millionaire in no time. If you want to read Tim's detailed article on how he reached a net worth of $225,000 by 25, I will have that in the show notes for you guys to check out. But you can also check it out on his blog at lifeforthebetter.com. That's lifeforthebetter.com. Tim, Thank you so much for inspiring us to hit our big goals and congratulations for being our money master of the week. Do you have a recent financial victory that you want to share on the show? You got to send me an email, my friends at Andy at marriagekidsandmoney.com or leave me a voicemail at marriagekidsandmoney.com slash voicemail. I would love to hear from you. You'll find all the links and resources for today's show at marriagekidsandmoney.com slash session 112. That's session 112. Before we go for the day, I wanted to let you know that I now have a commitment of about 500 bucks for hashtag Big Tip Tuesday. And to remind everybody, this is a giving challenge that I threw out a couple weeks ago to give a generous tip to someone who's working in the service industry during the holidays. And as an example for you all, I did mine just yesterday. I gave 100 bucks to my favorite Subway sandwich artist, and the smile on her face was just priceless, man. I could tell that the gift, the envelope that I gave her with hashtag Big Tip Tuesday on it, just immediately brightened her day. And it brightened mine, too. So join in on the fun, everybody. It is so much fun to give, especially to people who are working really hard during the holidays, man. So get out there and give. 
it's a lot of fun. I've got a YouTube video, which I'll put in the show notes that uh, outlines how the giving challenge, how Big Tip Tuesday all goes down. So check it out. In the spirit of growth and inspiration, I'm going to end the show with a quote today from Venus Williams. I don't focus on what I'm up against. I focus on my goals and I try to ignore the rest. Set those big goals and realize your dreams, my friends. Carpe diem! 